Hello everyone, welcome back to this video. This is part two of my series of looking at the arguments that the Quran makes and looking at why they are so poor, so bad, so fallacious that it couldn't possibly be of divine origin. So just a recap for anyone who hasn't seen the first part, the Quran makes multiple different arguments in favor of its own validity. The Quran makes arguments that demonstrate to the non-believer, the non-Muslim, why they should accept the Islamic belief that is present in the Quran. The Quran, in effect, makes arguments as to why non-Muslims should believe it. And of course, if the Quran is just from divine origin, the Quran is only from God, it has no human elements in it whatsoever, it is purely the word of Allah, then we should not see any evidence of poor, fallacious arguments because only man would make poor, fallacious arguments, not God. In the first part, we covered the argument that the Quran cannot be reproduced. You cannot make something like it. It is inimitable. You cannot create any work that meets the objective criteria of greatness that the Quran meets. You can watch that video up here to check that out. But in this video, we're covering the second point. The second point that the Quran makes, the second great divine argument the Quran states that demonstrates that the Quran has to be from God is this. If the Quran was not from God, it would have many contradictions in it. So where do we find this in the Quran? Well, we find this in Surah 4 or chapter 4, verse 82, where it says the following. Then do they not reflect upon the Quran? If it had been from any other than Allah, they would have found within it much contradiction. For those of you who might have seen me at Speaker's Corner and some of the videos online of me debating Muslims there, would know that I'm actually quite fond of pointing out a particular aspect of this verse. So let's boil that down. Very simple. The Quran is saying that if this was not from God, then it would have many contradictions. Now, at first hearing this, you might think, well, that kind of makes sense. You know, God would not make contradictions in his own scripture, his own words. Therefore, we shouldn't expect to find contradictions in scripture. Very plain and simple. But I ask you just to scratch the surface a little bit, and you'll see why this is such a plagued and just downright awful argument for a divine being, God, to, to make, to validate the Quran. Let's start off with point one. If this Quran had not been from Allah, there will be many contradictions in it. Following this logic, I could say this about anything that doesn't have any contradictions in it. Say, for example, I got a piece of paper, I got a pen, and I wrote a statement. It says, the sky is blue. And it's like, okay, well, if I told you that this statement is divine, and comes from God and not me, precisely because it has no contradictions in it, you'd probably look at me quite weird and think that <laughs> I wasn't quite right in every aspect. I had a few screws loose. Obviously, just because a statement is consistent or self-consistent and doesn't have any formal contradictions, that doesn't mean it's from God. It just means that whoever wrote it didn't contradict themselves while they were writing it. So really, the idea that if something is not from God, it must have contradictions is inherently false. Human beings can produce works that do not have contradictions. Hence, whoever made this argument wasn't particularly good with logic and reasoning. And this is why I think it's quite evident that this argument is from man, not from Allah. If Allah wrote this, you would have to think that he didn't know that human beings could write works that didn't have any contradictions in them. In fact, we have entire examples of texts that are larger and longer than the Qur'an that don't have any contradictions in them. All you need is a good set of proofreaders and enough time, and you'll have a work that has no contradictions. So I guess that means that Allah made it. Or maybe Allah is wrong when he says anything not from Allah would have contradictions in it. Now I want to move to point two, and this is something that if you watch my videos of Speaker's Corner, you'll realize I bring up a fair amount when the conversation of whether the Quran is contradictory is brought up. In this verse, in the Arabic in particular, the Arabic has the word much or many. In other words, the Quran isn't actually saying, and many Muslims will either knowingly or unknowingly mistake this. They'll say, if the Quran wasn't from God, there would surely be contradictions in it. And it's like, well, no, that's not actually what the text says. The text says there will be many contradictions in it. Okay, but we've shifted here. We've shifted from a precise statement, there would be a contradiction in it, that falsifies it, to an imprecise statement of there will be many contradictions in it. Okay, Allah, so how many is many? Quran never says. So now there's some ambiguity in exactly what is meant by finding contradictions, because the Quran doesn't tell you what that criteria is. 
Is it two contradictions? I mean, that could be many, but I'd say that's a couple. Three, I'd say is a few. Five or six maybe is many? Like how, how many is many? And is it many as man understands it or is it many as Allah understands it? And how can we know which is which? And how do we know what many is to man and what many is to Allah? Well, this is unknown and is never given to us in the Islamic tradition or in the Quran. What's profound about this is we need to remember that this is supposedly in the Quran, which is meant to be Allah's speech that is directly from him. No human involvement here. No human has added words into this. It is purely just the words of Allah. You would have to accept that any work that is from Allah would reasonably also have the same requirement. For example, we, if the Quran is from Allah because it's his speech, then it cannot have many contradictions in it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be from him. But the Quran is not the only thing that Allah has revealed. He has also revealed the Injil and the Torah and potentially other things as well. So it seems reasonable to take the same criteria and apply it to his other works that are also his speech. In which case then, we can say that we would reasonably expect to find in the Injil and the Torah many contradictions in it if it is not from Allah. Now, why do I bring this up? I bring this up precisely because it challenges many preconceptions that many Muslims have about how their religion works. They think that contradictions are the big end all of everything and it demonstrates that things cannot be from Allah precisely because they've been misinformed on what this verse actually says in the Quran. When really the Quran is actually fairly liberal about this precisely because it uses a plural form. That being, there has to be many contradictions to invalidate the Quran, not just one. So likewise, we would have the same in what is the Gospels and what is the Torah. So when a Muslim goes on the offensive and they say they're talking to a Christian and they would say something like, look, there are contradictions in your text, here's what they are. They don't really know from their own paradigm, this isn't as strong as they would like it to be. Their own paradigm says, well, actually it's multiple. It's not as simple as just finding a single one. And you would obviously then have to go further in this and show that they're not just apparent contradictions with their formal contradictions. Now all this works together to demonstrate that contradictions are actually not as strong as many people think. There are apparent contradictions in everyday life, for example, but no one takes them as being definitive of some refutation of just casual statements being made. Say for example, you hear the statement, Chris is in Spain. Now say for example, you hear from another person, Chris is in England. Now the apparent form of this seems to be that those are contradictory statements. I can't be in Spain at the same time that I'm in England, one of these has to be wrong. Well, think a little more for a few seconds and you realize, well, actually, it's perfectly reasonable for these statements to both be true. It isn't a formal contradiction at all. It's just an apparent one. It turns out that when we look at the broader context, there was a period of time when I was in Spain. So Chris is in Spain, that statement is true. And there's a different period of time where I am in England. And hence the statement, Chris is in England, is also true. Context, by and large, solves the overwhelming majority of supposed contradictions. A much stronger, in my view, claim at demonstrating falsehood in a text is actually just falsehoods. It's things that are just false. They, they are demonstrated to be false, preferably through reason and preferably through a known historical unquestionable backdrop. I think those are vastly superior in terms of demonstrating the truth claims of a text. And this is why I don't often use this understanding of contradictions in the Quran because there's just much more stronger statements. I'll give you some examples. You have Surah Al-Maida, Surah 5, Ayah 12, verse 12, which states quite plainly that Allah cannot be in any sense a father to the Jews or to the Christians because he disciplines them and hence he can't be a father. That to me is fallaciously wrong and demonstrably wrong in every sense. Another example is Surah Al-Miriam, Surah 19, Ayah 7, where it says that Yahya, the incorrect Arabic name that is supposed to be the Arabic version of Yohanan, John, it says that that name has never been given to anyone except for him. He's the first person with this name. That's demonstrably wrong. That's, that's not true. And hence you have to come up with alternative explanations for this because the plain reading of it is in fact demonstrably false. The irony, of course, is that we know from the Gospel of Luke, for example, the actual intended story is that no one in Zachariah's lineage, his family before him, his ancestors, had the name of Yohanan. But the Quran kind of tries to mimic this, but it gets it wrong and just says no one has ever had this name, Yahya, which is the Arabic form, which is weird. Or you could point out the mathematical problem of Surah 4, chapter 4, ayah 12, that talks about how inheritance is to be distributed once a relative dies. 
the issue with this, of course, is that in certain situations, you end up actually allocating more than 100% of the inheritance of that past individual to his family. So he's actually losing more than he actually owns in inheritance. I'm not sure how that's possible. But it's an issue that has been noted in Quranic studies. There are tons of these falsehoods that are quite clearly in error. Another classic example, how can God have a son if he has no consort? That's incorrect in terms of rationalizing this, and it's a very poor argument to make. It's worth noting as well that Muslims have a built-in reaction to the apparent contradictions in the Quran. They have Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah 2, Ayah 106 in the Quran that talks about how there are certain verses that are abrogated in favor of other verses that are equal to it or better than it. Yes, the Quran actually understands that it isn't fully consistent across all areas and has a doctrine to explain this embedded within its own text. Now, I think the correct way of viewing this is actually just an admission of guilt. By saying there is a doctrine that is found in the Quran that talks about how some verses that do seem to contradict other verses can be resolved by saying that they were revealed intentionally knowing that they are contradictory for the sole purpose of replacing one with the other, just admits that, yeah, they are contradictory. Rather, it's a way of saying, yes, these are contradictions and the Quran does contain them, but they are intentional because they have context behind them that explains why this was revealed for a period of time and then it was replaced by something else. The issue is, is I still think this meets the, the challenge that we saw earlier in Surah 4, Ayah 82, where Allah says, hey, if this was not from Allah, there'd be many contradictions in it. The Quran in Surah 2, Ayah 106 says, yeah, there are, <laughs> there are contradictions, but we replace them intentionally, and hence it's not an issue. Well, if the Quran recognizes that they're replacements, they don't work alongside them, then the Quran is acknowledging that, yes, it contains contradictions. But does it meet the standard of many contradictions? Ah, see, that's where the Quran gets you there. Another final point I want to bring up is the fact that, once again, like how this verse is in the Qur'an and is talking about the Qur'an as Allah's speech, because the Torah and the Injil, the Gospel and the Torah in the Old Testament and the New Testament, are also supposedly Allah's words, it would seem as if that criteria of having to have multiple contradictions in it for it not to be from God would also apply to them. It also seems like the doctrine of abrogation, the idea that, hey, anytime Allah reveals a verse, it's okay if it contradicts another verse because this verse replaces it and it is either the same or it is better than it. That doctrine should also work for the previous scriptures because, again, it comes straight from Allah. And if Allah can do it in the Quran, why can't he do it in the Injil Torah? This then makes the whole arguments that any Muslim comes up to say, hey, the contradictions in your gospel, the contradictions in the Torah. You could simply say, well, there was a doctrine of abrogation. So it's not a contradiction. It's actually just that one verse is being replaced by another verse that only appears to contradict. But really, Allah knows best and he's just doing his thing. Not really sure how a Muslim would even attempt to deal with that because they would have to demonstrate that was not a criteria that didn't also apply to the prior scriptures. So in summary, we've demonstrated that from a purely logical point of view, having a text or a recitation that has no contradictions doesn't necessarily entail it's from God. Hence, even if the Quran didn't have any contradictions in it at all, that wouldn't actually have any weight at all in demonstrating that it is from Allah. Just like if I wrote a textbook that talked about the anatomy of ducks that had no contradictions in it, that wouldn't mean the anatomy of ducks textbook is from God no matter how well written it is. The second point is that the Arabic is plural, so there has to be many contradictions here, not just one. How many is many? We don't know. That's very imprecise language and it kind of weakens the argument. This would also apply to the previous scriptures, so now Muslims need to be consistent when they ever go on the attack against our scriptures because, well, you can't have your cake and eat it. If the Quran is clear that you need to find many, looks like you gotta do that for the other scriptures too. And then finally, the Qur'an kind of softly acknowledges that there are actually apparent contradictions in the Qur'an. That's why there is a doctrine of abrogation, and the doctrine of abrogation wouldn't make no sense if this wasn't the case. The doctrine of abrogation literally just means we have one verse revealed, and then we get rid of it to replace it with another one that has a difference in meaning in the difference in ruling. And hence, yeah, that would necessarily be 
a contradiction. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that is today's video. Let me know what you think about the argument from many contradictions and whether you think it's a convincing argument that the Quran makes or whether you think that this argument is most likely of human origin. God bless you all. I hope you have a great day. If you're not a Christian, then today's the day you become one. If you have any questions about the Christian faith, you can email me at chris.speakerscorner.com. My email is linked down below in the description box. God bless you all and have a great day. Take care.